I'm kind of embarrassed by the, uh, the introduction, partly because in British English, I'm not a professor, and I'm not actually a professor at Princeton, I'm an affiliate, but that's okay. <laughs> Let, let's get on. This is my actual title slide. You've already seen that. So my normal talk, uh, and this is the one from 1998, if you can't tell by the robot, is about why uh, people are overprojecting when they think that artificial intelligence is something that is a human, right? That intelligent means human. Um, yeah, so this is my normal talk. It seems weird that people want very desire, they, they want very much to uh, build their best friend and be able to turn their partner and their life partner on and off. And uh, that's weird, but that's not the talk. <laughs> the talk today is about deep learning. Um, and as I promised yesterday on Twitter, here's the slide that literally says, deep learning is not magic. No learning is magic, right? So a lot of people, I think the reason that they believe that artificial intelligence is going to save us and bring us uh, a new age of, uh, of uh, perfect fairness is that they think that uh, AI is math. AI is not math. AI is computation, intelligence is computation, and computation is a physical process. That means it takes time, space, and energy. Um, for those of you who are computer scientists, you already had this in your you know, computer science 101, the theory of computation. The point is uh, what we call it in computer science is combinatorics. So there's actually more possible short chess games, 35 move chess games. I'm not just talking about moving the rooks back and forth, right? Um, then there are atoms in the universe, okay? And real life is actually giving you a lot more options than just playing chess, right? So there isn't some problem with artificial general intelligence that if we come up with one algorithm, suddenly we'll know everything. It is impossible to know everything, all right? So why is it that we're so smart? We're so smart because we're really good at taking all the computation that other humans do and now that machines do, and sort of pooling it together and taking out the best lessons, right? So that's the thing that makes humans different from the other chimpanzees. All right, so my argument here, and this is the fast 20-minute version of my talk, too, in case you feel like I'm moving a lot. <laughs> the, the, my argument here is that the spectacular recent growth of artificial intelligence is because we've gotten really good at using machine learning to upload the computation that's already been done. Now, on the top there, you see the Boston Dynamics walkers. A lot of that is motion capture. So while it's very good engineering, I mean, it's amazing engineering, they're still exploiting the exploration that nature has done for 4 billion years, right? And of course, the bottom, again, incredible piece of engineering, but one of the ways they're making Watson work is by having it read all of human culture, right? You, you heard the whole story about they put the, uh, the Urban Dictionary into it because they thought there might be some slang that they would need. But since it's also a generative model, they had to take it back out again. <laughs> anyway, um, I actually think, and people are surprised when I say this, that the rate of th this incredible rate is going to sort of plateau as we get to the point where we actually have uploaded all this stuff. That doesn't mean it's going to, I don't want to say asymptote, it's not going to stop because our culture is already like a knowledge building machine. And with machine learning and with AI, we're going to continue and accelerate the rate at which our culture is um, expanding. But AI is going to kind of join us at that frontier, right? We're, we don't, we're not going to be able to just upload stuff that was done 4 billion years ago. All right. So one consequence of all this is that artificial intelligence is not necessarily better than we are. And people, for whatever reason, again, this math being platonic and perfect and, I don't know, uh, before the fall, uh, thought that AI was going to be better. But this is the reason that people now think I do uh, machine prejudice. I, <laughs> I actually think this paper is about semantics, but I'm going to tell you about this. Um, OK, so this is a bit of a hop. But do you guys know Quine? How many people know your philosophy? Yay, somebody, philosopher. OK, good. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, interesting guy that talked about what, how do we know th what things mean? What does meaning even mean, right? Um, that, you, know, you might think that you just point at a dog and then people go, oh, it's a dog, right? But everyone who's done machine learning knows that's harder than it seems. 
One of the hypotheses that people had talked about for a long time is that maybe there's no more to what a word means than how it's used. Maybe that's exactly the same. Now, that sounds like reductionist. You're saying, well, how is that useful? But um, it is. Let's hopefully, <laughs> this will get clearer. Um, yeah, I'm not going to try to explain that. I'm going to keep going because I can see the clock ticking down. <laughs> Ask me at the end if you're still confused. All right. So if that's true, we should be able to test it with a computer. So back in the 90s, we figured out, hey, let's do that. And so we looked at a corpus of words, and we would just see there'd be a target word, and there'd be words that are next to it. And you would see how often, well, basically, you would count how a few of the words, a few of this, the most frequent words, but not the most frequent words, co-occurred next to the word that you had. Now, I'm, how many people here know about word embeddings? OK, not as many as I, was, I thought. OK. Uh, how many people here know about vectors? All right. <laughs> OK, so basically, you're just building a vector. So if you had 75 words you're keeping track of, for each of them, you said, OK, let's say I'm keeping track of hat. How many times does hat occur next to large? And how many times does hat occur next to corpus? And then the, the hypothesis here is that the more similar those vectors are, the more similar the meaning is. And that's what meaning is. It's all about a relationship between words, OK? All right, so yeah, I just told you that. And it was the second most frequent. Otherwise, you just got syntax. And so what? Yeah, and so meaning is a cosine in 75 dimensional space. Sorry, joke. <laughs> all right, so then you would project your 75 dimensional space into two dimensions and get a publication, right? And you'd say, oh, look, you know, uh, uh, queen and king aren't too far from each other, and soldier and sailor aren't too far from each other. And you know, that, that, that's what people looked at. But you actually measure the distance between cosines by, uh, by I'm sorry, between vectors by cosines. And then there was like a 70% correlation with humans. And you said, wow, that's pretty good, right? Now, new way. The, the, the insight that, me and, uh, that myself and my colleagues had was, let's compare contemporary word embeddings to uh, the implicit association task. Now, first of all, you have to understand about the implicit association task. Have you heard of implicit bias? I'm making you guys raise your hands a lot. Nobody's heard of implicit bias? Oh, hardly anyone. OK. <laughs> the philosopher was in the front row, so he was easier to see. <laughs> OK. The um, implicit OK. Uh, I'll slow down and explain this one. There are some concepts that are easier to associate with each other, right? And even those results I was showing you about trying to say, is our semantics good, was based on something called reaction time. So you're just trying to say, how quickly can you hit the button? How quickly do you understand and hit the button to show that you understand something, right? In this case, with the implicit association task, we're trying to see if uh, it's easier to associate boys with math and girls with reading than girls with math and boys with reading. Now, if the world was perfectly fair, then those should be equally easy. But if there's some kind of bias or stereotype that you think, oh, girls are more into reading and boys are more into math, then you're going to have a shorter reaction time when you can do the easy thing, which is boy math and girl reading, than when you have to do the harder thing, which is boy, boy reading and girl math. Does that make sense? It's important to realize that all of the results I'm going to show you, this, first of all, this all comes out of psychology that was, again, done in the 90s. And secondly, that it was, it's always these two by two comparisons. OK, so you're not saying girls are bad at math. You're saying girls are more associated with math, with math than reading or the other way around, depending on the reaction time. All right? OK, so I've just said this. Associated concepts are easier to pair, and so we measure that by looking at the differences in reaction time. And again, this is typical of when you're doing these kinds of measures. We're not necessarily saying there's no overlaps, but we're looking at the, different, the distance between the averages. All right? And what we, measure, we measure that in terms of standard deviations. Okay? And it's a huge result in psychology if you get a D. This is the measure. One standard deviation is a D. That's a huge result, if you get, again, if you get like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, that's incredible. The implicit association task, unfortunately, the implicit biases are one of the largest and most reliable effects in psychology. But they aren't well understood, because they are only implicit, and they don't cor correspond necessarily 
to explicit biases, like what you would do, who you would choose to work with, or things like that. OK, so I've already mentioned that. All right, so basically, there's two hypotheses here, which I had sort of failed to realize when I was trying to explain this to people before. One is that AI built with machine learning will contain our implicit biases, right? But the other one is that implicit biases are a part of ordinary semantics. And we're sort of looking at those two at the same time. And that's what made the paper exciting enough, I think, to get into science. All right. Rather than doing this thing about counting 75 words or whatever, we actually used, uh, well, two different corpora. This is just one of them. It's the, um, the GloVe project at Stanford. It's a standard form of word embedding. It's a little more complicated than just counting. You do some waiting for stuff that's far away. And it's based on 840 billion words. It was basically the whole English language web, right? And 2.2 million of those are unique. We needed that big of a corpus because some of the words the psychologists used were very low frequency. So that was all we could do. We also did the same stuff over again, and it's in the supplement of the paper, using word to vec which was trained on Google News. So this is telling you two different representations of word embedding, and also two different corpora. And for both of them, we get the same results. All right. And also, it's all off the shelf. So we didn't introduce any biases ourselves. This is all, everything was out of the previous literature. We didn't do any cherry picking. All right. Um, as you can guess, there's some uh, exciting uh, but disturbing results. But before we get to those, um, we're going to look at the universal biases, which is basically Greenwald et al. also had to deal with sensitive material. And it occurred to them that it was one way is to get people used to that is to think about something no one disagrees with. And here, what no one disagrees with is that flowers are more pleasant than insects, or insects are more unpleasant than flowers. Like I said, it's sort of a two by two. All right. So these are the way the results look. The, um, and again, only 32 people, a D of 1.35. That is gigantic. Huge result. And you can't entirely compare our findings because we don't have people. We have words. So when you reduce the number of words, we're going to get a lower uh, probability here. That's just sort of a coincidence that looks almost the same. But what matters is that both these methods tell you that their clusters are completely separate, right? So we've definitely found two different things, right? So yes, as you can guess, um, it, we're not only going to show you uh, gender biases, but also racial biases, right? So this was the original findings. And then Eileen uh, Kaliskan had the good idea of going and looking at the uh, resume study. This is the famous study where uh, they sent out resumes with exactly the same resume, but just African-American or European-American names. And you got 50% fewer invitations to interview if you had an African-American name, right? So using those same names, we get pretty much the same results. OK. So yes, there's gender bias, too, about are you domestic or are you oriented towards a career? Um, or do you like science or do you like art? Um, I think that as disturbing, if you've never seen it before, as the implicit bias results are, this is incredibly exciting from an AI perspective. I mean, really strong AI, right? We're, we're telling you that machine learning is giving you visceral facts about human qualia, right? This whole thing about the insects being unpleasant or whatever. You know, without any direct experience of the world. When I started doing my PhD, we were building this humanoid robot because we thought that AI had failed because it didn't have experience that humans had had. But what you're seeing here is that we're uploading human experience, right? When we just have, we're just looking at a word embedding, it's just looking at our text, and it's getting our prejudices. And this might be, I mean, that's actually another slide, but this also might be the source, or some of the sources of human prejudices, contemporary human prejudices. Obviously, this stuff had to be built from somewhere. Somebody had the experience of the insects and flowers. But now we can get them indirectly, all right? So now, if that wasn't disturbing enough, um, the, the, the final author, Arvind Narayanan, is up for tenure this year at Princeton. <laughs> So he was really nervous about how, we all thought this was an exciting project, but we were freaked out about just how you don't usually get that strong of a match. And so he said, I want to see how this stuff works against something I know is true. 
And so we've got two different things here, and I don't, do I have a laser? Oh, yes, I do. Okay, good. So um, here is the stuff that just showed you that, uh, you know, the, all these evil stereotypes about women being more domestic and, and, and less associated with careers. So on, on the y-axis here, we're talking about how male or female we think words are. And then the words we've chosen on this graph are the jobs that are in the US labor statistics for 2015, okay? So we did this work in 2016. It comes out a year later. That's how, how academia works. Um, so this down here is the proportion of people in those jobs who are women. And if you're wondering about the outliers, the thing is that this technique only works for single words, and some of the jobs had two words. So we actually did some pretty nasty uh, scraping. <laughs> but nevertheless, despite the nasty scraping, 90% correlation. You never get that. So this is telling us that uh, America is dominating the English language web, which people might have already noticed, that the, that the present is dominating the web because this is a contemporary result. Again, people already knew that. We're like doubling the amount of content or whatever on the web every year. This over here is um, names. So names like Sandy or Chris or whatever that could both women and men might have. And again, you get here only an 84% correlation but this is from 1990, which is the last time that we could get this data. So I would call this a prediction. I would expect this to be close to 100% for 2015. All right. So all this makes us have to think a little differently about what we mean when we say prejudice, um, and actually what we mean by when we say bias. So in artificial intelligence, you know, I've been teaching pe people this for decades. <laughs> it's a professor. Uh, a bias is just the expectations derived uh, from our experience of the world. In machine learning, we, mean, we want bias, right? Otherwise, we, get, we have nothing. We have no knowledge. Bias is just information. A stereotype, and now this is according to sociologists to get this def differentiation, a stereotype is a bias that we don't wish to persist. Okay? A stereotype is just the knowledge you have. So the so sociologists would normally say, you know, it's, bi it's, it's wrong biases. Um, Prejudice is acting on that stereotype, and that goes back to that difference between implicit and explicit bias, all right? So what our results indicate is that we all have these stereotypes because it's just a subset of the bias we derive from our culture. But what matters is whether we act on them, all right? So you have a bias that you may notice, unfortunately, one of those dots that was up in the corner there was that uh, hardly any women are programmers. In fact, far fewer than when I was programming. That was one of the things I found most disturbing about this whole paper, was finding out how few women program now. All right, but we all know that right now, I've told you, right? We can read that from the US labor statistics. A stereotype is just that component of programmer, which is the, that a lot of them are male. But a prejudice would be hiring only males because you say, well, that's what a programmer is, right? So the, the, there's a really critical implication here, which is that stereotypes are culturally determined. We have made the decision, and it, notice it is not universal, that women should have careers. We, it, and you get people saying, how could you possibly have a, a, not just a fair society, but a productive society unless women are able to, uh, and to work, but it's something we've des decided, and there's no particular other way except for to know about your culture, to know which biases are stereotypes. Okay, so how should we address it? Now, this is getting into opinion. The rest was fact. <laughs> um, I think that the best way to do this is the way we do it um, ourselves, right? So the implicit knowledge of statistics, and it's the way that we basically bootstrap the intelligence. It's how we find out what's going on in the world. Explicit knowledge um, is stuff we can learn quickly, right? So I, I can remember what I had for breakfast this morning, that, and I can tell you about it. I can't remember when I learned the word deep, right? Um, so let's see, I can't remember the rest of this. All right. So explicit knowledge is associated with deliberate control. Now, don't forget, the, the thing about the resume study, it may be that people flipping through resumes are not consciously realizing what they like or dislike about the study. They may not be saying, I don't like African-American names, but they, for some reason, sorted those into different piles. So we don't really know how much of our behavior is controlled explicitly or, or implicitly, but still, 
this seems to be what we're, we're doing. All right, so I've just told you that I think that we need to have basically a separate system to keep track of uh, what words you don't say. And that might sound like too much trouble, like you, I'm saying you need conscious AI, but just think about text prediction. Text prediction has a short list of words that never predicts, right? That's already a, an example of this kind of system, all right? These guys from, uh, they're mostly from BU and Microsoft, uh, disagreed and they thought, oh, we should take the math and, re you know, the, the vectors and just warp them. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. The, uh, basically, it assumes that you can enumerate all the, the different ways you're prejudiced. I don't think we realize all that stuff. Um, and it also assumes that what you want is consistent. Again, it's this myth that, we, that if everything was neutral, every stuff, stuff would be okay. There's provable things. There's, they're called, uh, for example, oh, Arrow, Arrow's voting uh, theorem, that you cannot have everything you want because a lot of it is, is, uh, uh, contradicts each other. So that's just not the way fairness works. Fairness and ethics are, are something we drive. We, we work really hard on coming up with ways that we can all sit in the room together and not start competing for, I don't know, sitting in the front or, or being on stage, right? We spend a lot of time on that, and it's not trivial, all right? It's not just, oh, we need to get back to, the, you know, the pre-Apple the pre thing. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, like Adam and Eve, not Apple, the computers. <laughs> all right. So there's at least three biases, okay, sources of bias, and I want to uh, close with this because I think it's an important point. The, uh, there's this implicit bias I've just told you about that you're going to have an AI because it, because it is just an expression of our own culture. Um, there's the accidental bias that we've seen, you know, famously the stuff with Google and the gorillas. Um, and there's also deliberate bias. And I really worry about the fact that the accidental bias was getting all the New York Times play and then our paper, you know, got a bunch of play, and people, I, you know, it's great to hear politicians talking about our work at Davos and Steve Colbert talking about our work. But I don't want to overlook AI is programmed; it's built for a purpose. And someone can come in and say, "I don't want people from that side of town getting our money because we don't have enough money anymore," right? And we—it's just this is the biggest deal, the deliberate stuff we have to think about. So how are we going to deal with these problems? Um, well, the implicit stuff, as I said, I think we have to compensate with design. Other people are trying to come up with other solutions, but I think that's the best thing we can do. The accidental, yes, we can diversify the, work sp the workforce, but I think we need more. We have to keep testing. Um, we need to log how we do the decisions. And then when we find out we've made a mistake, we fix it. And that's actually cool. That's what we do with human society anyway, and AI might help us do it faster. And if you talk to people from HR departments, they love how things have gotten better since they've been able to use AI to help them be as fair as they want to be, right? So AI is actually helping us improve our own society. It's not just about improving the AI. All right, and then finally, with the deliberate stuff, the only thing we can do is audit the code. If someone comes and says, I'm not getting as much money since a different uh, a political party came in, we have to go in and see why, all right? And I think, uh, I said I was finishing, but this is an extension of that point. You know, AI products have architecture. Architects have regulation. Architects, when they're undergraduates, learn about policy, laws, how to work with the government, and, you know, how to work with lawmakers. And buildings, after you put them up, get inspected. They have to have gotten, you know, architects get licensed. Why has all this happened? Because, you know, centuries ago, anybody rich could just build a building and they'd collapse on people some of the time, right? And we said, no. At some point, we got together and put up a bunch of structure. AI is now that important. So AI is now becoming something that falls down on people, right? And it affects everyone. And it's not just AI. It's ICT. It is about how we're connected. But I think we have to you know, realize we've, we've gotten promoted, right? <laughs> we're up there. We're professionals like architects. We are changing the world. And so we have to cooperate with government. So in conclusion, Artificial and natural intelligence are continuous with each other, right? It's, it's, it's just an extension of us. It is just a part of our culture. And unfortunately, that means that net neutral magic fairies of mathematical purity will not fix our problems for us, right? AI has to be biased because computation takes time, space, and energy 
so we have to exp exploit the work that's already been done. Uh, human culture contains traces of our history, which includes our prejudices and the things that cause our prejudices, right? So um, my uh, desire is that we design our systems modularly and transparently, right? So that we can make it easier to explicitly correct and debug them, and that's what work I do with my PhD students. Um, and also, I think we should exploit the culture. Sorry. Oh, sorry. A rephrase. Just because I've said all this does not mean that I think AI is human, but I would need a whole other talk to, to explain that, <laughs> right? So, but this is the bottom line of that. AI is not, um, AI, unlike people, can be continuously backed up, made redundant, made unambitious, um, and know its own maker, okay? And we shouldn't even make it a legal person, and that's the other big paper I had in 2017. I strongly recommend you read that if you're thinking about that and you work for the European Commission. All right, thank you.